Hey, Petra. Wow. Can you tell us a little bit um, about your life in art so far? Sure. So um, I studied jazz at Music College and I'm a drummer. So I did jazz drums at Leeds College of Music and um, yeah, had a great time, like was challenged plenty and met some great people. And um, yeah, I would say most of the most of the creative work that I've done so far has come about, even if not directly, indirectly through studying at Leeds. That's, um, yeah, I think that's true to say. And uh, let me think. So I worked, main, I played mainly sort of jazz and then did like sort of commercial gigs, you know, like functions and theatre things like a lot of people do um, and then I went away and worked on cruise ships for a while for P&O cruises and that was um, that was mainly playing sort of theatre show uh, type thing so it would be production shows with singer, teams of singers and dancers but then you'd also do uh, they'd have these like solo like acts that would fly in so you do like a rehearsal with them in the morning on their material and then do the shows in the evening uh really enjoyed it learned a lot um through doing that ended up becoming a musical director and a band leader and that really uh i really loved that like I, again i just learned a lot and i learned a lot about um uh what would be a good term well you know in the kind of suit wearing business world they call it stakeholders wouldn't they do you know what i mean like so so you learn a lot about the pressures on uh even in something that's really well set up and designed like a cruise ship there's still like a lot of different people that have input into that you need that you need to be able to rely on to do the thing that you're supposed to do and there's a lot of people relying on you to do things so they can do the things they're supposed to be doing so yeah there was a real i really enjoyed that sort of aspect of it um and then occasionally every now and then i'd get to play some nice like trio sort of piano jazz where there wasn't really any um there wasn't too much um input from the outside and what we were playing you know we could kind of kind of choose ourselves but even then you you want the people that are there to enjoy it you know you're not just it wasn't um yeah it wasn't a purely creative enterprise but there was certainly room to be creative within what we were doing yeah and i think actually speaking creatively even within that think there were things about doing that job like playing some piano trio jazz in a in a bar on a cruise ship that made me think in a bigger way about what creativity was so up until that point i think i thought of creativity in a real microcosm way it's like is the thing you know the combination of beats i'm playing on my drums is that creative right now a lot of the time maybe the answer was could have, well it might have been yes or no but thinking about it in a more like macro a bigger sense it's like, well, okay, is the experience I'm creating for the people that are here, is that creative? You know, am I actually thinking about that sort of bigger picture? Can I do that in a creative way? The answer to that was always yes. Um, you know, the specific interactions with people in the audience was like an opportunity for creativity. Um, and for me, and this is probably what led me down the path I'm on now, the the whole uh all of the interactions concerned with making a gig like that happen became an op were i saw as a creative act like for human interaction required to be able to go and do a set there's a lot of creativity in there if you choose to see it like that and then so that was cruise ships and then uh which i enjoyed and then oh um do, um do you think it helped you to develop that because you had this steady gig where you played night after night after night because i think a lot these days a lot of times you go from one gig to another gig that's completely different so you have like five adjustments a week but you have to yes. do five different gigs a week because you want to work but 
right. how energy goes into the adjustment rather than your self-development because i assume when you're on the cruise ship you you just have a gig and then the next day you can try something that you thought of the day before because you don't have to learn a completely new show where you don't you know have a pile of sheet music in front of you to... yeah nice well well i mean we we did have a pile of sheet music in front of us but usually we'd seen that pile of sheet music 17 times before so oh. yeah you're what what you're saying is exactly right petra i think yeah so um yeah and whilst i was doing those gigs exactly like you say um uh i used to think quite a lot about you know there's that malcolm gladwell book that um outliers you know where he talks about that ericsson um 10, hour rule and um i used to think about the story about the beatles in there a lot so he gladwell talks about um the beatles playing in hamburg and playing from like I can't remember what the hours were, but it was like, you know, six o'clock at night until three o'clock in the morning, you know, playing like nine sets, you know, just some incredible workload. And um, and the fact that, of course, once you do that, and most of the time, or I'm sure maybe it's even all of the time when they were doing that, they were playing covers. Like they weren't, that was not a period where they were being creative in the sense of writing incredible new, and recording incredible new music, but definitely honed a productive skill set And, and a work ethic and um and i think i did get a taste of that yeah when i was working on cruise ships that fact that you were yeah you were on a you there's a lot more certainty on a steady gig you know what you're doing when uh you so there are some things that are just taken care of you know what actually even just not having to like drive for three hours to get to the gig and then set up even just that made a big difference and the fact that you know maybe you do the same show twice or a, a, or or sometimes even three times in a night and each one had to be good like you couldn't like use the you can't use the first set as the warm up because those people in the audience are only going to see that version of the show so you've got to hit it but then you've also got to hit it with that same energy four at three hours later when you do the third version of that show so um yeah and i think that's all i think that's all i think people that never do that kind of work i think it's very hard to fake that in your rehearsal that kind of thing of having to go like all out and give something everything but then having to do it again through you know learning to pace yourself and um yeah I, i don't know where else you would go these days to get that kind of experience um so yeah it was great for me it did one really good things for me awesome so um in college a lot of people say they don't go to college for what they learn because they could learn the same with a private teacher and probably for cheaper but it's the connection you make in in college that are your first network out there And I think music, especially jazz, depends a lot on your network. What was your experience with um, using your connections from college or even building new connections? Right. Um, well, I, I agree with a large part of that sentiment. I would add to that. I learned a tremendous amount at college that I don't think I necessarily would have learned from just having a private teacher you know you don't go to music college to get drum lessons mm -hmm. and you don't just go to make connections i think that's a, i think that when people say that i think they're 100% right that it's super important and maybe it's even the most important part but um maybe i can split the difference i would say that yeah so i would say that um the not the most important learning for me at music college was not necessarily in the formal taught classes, mm -hmm. but you can't get that number of interactions in a day and that number of learning opportunities in a day, sitting at home, practicing in your bedroom. You just, you can't because you won't, how are you going to meet that number of people? And there's a rehearsal room on the next corridor 
You know, how are you going to how are you going to organize that? How are you going to organize all the stuff that goes wrong that you then have to deal with? That's another big part of, I think, going to college and was true of the cruise ship thing. It's like, yeah, it's not a perfect environment. It's a real life. You know, I know sometimes people talk about college as being not real life, but it's a lot more real life than just practicing to play alongs in your bedroom. You know, it's a lot more. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you've got to contend with a lot more of the realities of other people. And um, anyway, so that's what I would think about your maybe about the the way you asked the question. But in terms of the network, which is what you actually asked about. Uh, yeah, it was really important. Like I met some of my they're still my best friends. I met some of those people are still some of my favorite musicians. Um, a lot of them, in fact, almost all of those people moved down to London either before at the same time or slightly, you know, around the same time that I did. Um, so yeah, you get, I got a little transfer of my network, which was nice. Um, yeah, I think it was extremely important. You, you can't, again, maybe a little bit like with the cruise ship thing, how are you going to, how are you going to fake build a relationship where you've been together with someone figuring stuff out for three or four years? I, how are you going to do that you can do it you can do it if you start an originals band you know if you find if you somehow through another means find a few like super like-minded people and you make a commitment long term that you're going to like build something then yeah you can you can get the same maybe value that i got from music college but i think that's i think that's hard to do you know so yeah the network was really important i still i still love and respect and love listening to those people that i met there you know i would say most of the people that i really hung out with did end up moving to london not everybody stayed but not not all of the people you know people went up a few people did go off in their own directions a couple of people stayed in leeds but yeah i think it's a great place it's probably the easiest place to make a network Awesome. Um, was it ever hard for you to declare that you're an artist? Yeah, I don't think I did that the whole time I was at college. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think I did it. Um, it's probably a relatively recent thing that I've become comfortable saying like that, which is strange as I've actually, you know, during the pandemic, I've focused my energy in, it, well, I would still consider it an expression of artistry, actually. But um, I've focused it been maybe more focused outside of playing the drums but did I ever have a problem yeah I didn't I didn't consider myself an artist when I was at college I didn't I wasn't actually trying to be an artist when I was at college or at least I didn't think I was I was trying to be really good at the drums and be really good at playing jazz um, and I saw myself at the time what I was aiming for was that kind of well yeah you you you're aware of this language because I know you interact with musicians a lot um, but I was aiming for that kind of like uh, like elite sideman type, you know, you know, the kind of like someone that could like do like versatile and play well in a lot of different scenarios. And so it, in a lot of ways, I think my my goal was rooted in what life was actually like, maybe more in the 70s, you know, <laughs> like a lot. Of, yeah, I mean that seriously. And, and it was fine. It served me. It served me well in the end. But um yeah, I wasn't really trying to be, I don't think I was really trying to be an artist. I definitely was trying to be creative. I uh, definitely, and I was being an artist. I just didn't declare it so. Um, yeah, I think I thought artistry was something that my bosses had and, you know, the people that I'd be playing for would have, and I'd be facilitating their artistry. But yeah, I would think differently about that now. It's funny because um, because you said you identify with like the 70s and then I was identified with the avant-garde period in Paris and I'm like, oh, I'm just a hundred years late. Like I should have yeah. been in Paris a hundred years before. I would have been spot on. <laughs> yeah, likewise. Yeah, it's like I was born 40 years, too, well, not 40 years, but, you know, a generation or two too late. Um, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? And also, of course, it's not true because you can just take the values that you have and the things that you think you're important. And you can, well, as I know you are, like, brilliantly, like, you just have to sort of repackage them slightly, don't you, to fit the modern context. But yeah.
Um, did you ever think about, um, did you record your own albums? Or did you ever work as like? Mm. Yeah. So do you mean specifically at college or no, any time just... since? Yeah. So um, I've been part of a lot of other people's recordings, including some like nice original music. Uh, including some wacky original music that I really enjoyed playing and was definitely on that path to trying to do something different, you know. Um, and I also did, yeah, I worked really hard with, I collaborated with a couple of good friends of mine, um, Brendan Douse and Simone Kay, and we did like kind of a poppy kind of soul album. Uh, that's quite a few years ago now, but that was a great learning process and a really fun experience um i think if i yeah so so yeah i've been part of original music and and albums and that thing was i would definitely consider that was i don't mean exclusively mine but you know i was i was an equal share in that album uh with the with simone and brendan um yeah enjoy i love that stuff you know it's great and um, um, what, what do you want to say about like the uh or can you comment on the entrepreneurial side of being a musician a little bit? Because I would say a lot of it is also creating your own opportunities. And especially in the beginning, you don't exactly have people throwing money at you. So you end up doing <laughs> a lot of things yourself, you know, press releases or your marketing, contacting people for gigs. Um, what would you say, what was your expenses, uh, experiences um, with it? One more time. What was your experience with it? And um, what would you say to like upcoming musicians or artists um, that they should do sooner maybe that you realized? Oh, that's a nice question. Yeah, okay. So I can give you a couple of um, sort of I wishes. So when I was at college, I wish I had read a couple of books just on straight marketing like in the 20th century or the 21st century um, and if anybody cares I would suggest checking out a guy called Seth Godin mm -hmm. he's an author and uh, yeah I'm oh, sure yeah, Pedro, I, you're books. I forgot um... he's written he's written a lot of books so ones that might be of interest to creative people musicians and artists something like tribes it's a great book something like um it's got one called purple cow which i would definitely recommend and then if you're really interested in getting your message out there whether that's a creative project you know some work something that is yours i would recommend he's got a kind of a bigger more comprehensive book called um Oh, it's a big orange book. I think it's called This Is Marketing. It's a big orange book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would absolutely, uh, and I mean, I'm really into that stuff now. Like I really enjoy thinking about it. And But I, I think all of it applies to artists. And especially if you, especially if you can put away the fantasy of wanting to be like a starving artist, if you can put that down and say, oh no, actually I would like to get paid for my work. Um, and I can. Um, then yeah, those things are, yeah, I wish I'd read those things at college and had that churning away, building up, noticing things over the next few years. Um, so that would be the first thing entrepreneurially, um, I would suggest, I think you've got to think about marketing and you've got to think about marketing as being part of the creative process, not something you do to sell it. What is marketing? Marketing is like, making something and then i'm going to steal directly from seth godin so making something and then saying to another human being here i made this mm -hmm. that that's marketing and that person that you're handing it to it's either for them or it's not for them and they'll let you know but you know that's um that's a marketing interaction isn't it and if you're not going to do that well are you uh, i'm not sure if you're i was obsessed with a long time well i still am really like the word professional means a lot to me you know, that really means something to me. So like as a musician, I wanted to be a professional and as a coach, I'm a professional and uh, an artist. Like if you want to be a professional, you've got to show your work to someone eventually. And that's what marketing is, you know? Um, 
And then there's steps like, and again, this is all, I mean, this is all exclusively come from things that I've heard from Seth. I mean, there are plenty of other people you could check out, but Seth asked a couple of really, Seth Godin asked a couple of really straightforward questions. He says, what do you do and who is it for? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, if you can answer, so at least have those ideas in, in your head when you're making something, at least be aware of the thoughts. Like, who am I actually writing or building this thing, whatever it is, whether it's an album or a tune even, who is it for? Who, who do I want to enjoy this? And um, I think, and then the only other thing, and then I'll shut up, is um, that of like, if you're not making it for anyone specific, then you're, if you're making it for everyone, then you're not making it for anyone. Mm -hmm. Like that idea of, um, which again is not mine. I'm just kind of doing. I feel like you should have just interviewed Seth Godin actually for this part of the. Uh, I'm open. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, he might be as well. You know, I've never met him, but I'm, he seems very nice. So that's it. So I think just be aware, be aware of some questions like that. Just read something. I did a couple of. Um, did I do it when I first got to London? Not when I first moved to London, but when I realised that even as like trying to be a sides person, as I was at the time, and wanting to work for other people, really, um, even then I, I needed to have a bit of an identity myself. Like someone needed to be able to say, oh, you're doing that, you should get John, as opposed to we need some guy or John's some guy. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, when I, it took me ages, but when I did realise that maybe... I needed to have, I needed to know who I was as a drummer. What my, what do I like? You know, what do I want to do more than other things? When I had that realization, I did a couple of like little online, little online courses on them. Um, again, Seth again. So Seth's got loads, like there's one on being a freelancer. So I wasn't even trying to be an entrepreneur. I was just trying to be a freelancer. And, um, but yeah, I think it's, I think wherever you go for the information, investigate what it means you know in the wider sense to be a freelancer to be an artist you know what there's more to it than just making the thing you have to talk, tell that story actually that's the fun oh so so Pardon? i hadn't logged into twitter for about five years and then i um then yeah i logged into my twitter account and there was um yeah, there was a message from Petra, who I didn't, of course, know at that point. It was a completely, like, cold message. And I can't remember exactly what you said, although I'm sure my message is the message is still on my... I haven't, I wouldn't have deleted it. You know, I'm sure it's still on my Twitter account, but I think you basically... Did you say something like, yeah, I'm a tap dancer, like, so you fancy a jam? Yeah, I think I was like, something like that. Yeah, looked, it was pretty... I, I was just looking to meet more musicians and, you know... Yeah, and how long had you been in town at that point? A while because I came here when I was 20 because it was a contemporary dancer first or I was a right. now I'm a contemporary dancer and a tap dancer. I used to be an all over the place dancer that took sure. any job that was there because I was also trapped into this I want to be professional dancer mindset and I took any dance job from street dance to installations to Bollywood movies and just so I have a paycheck that says mm. dance on it you know what i mean so totally um, i know exactly what you mean yeah it also took me a while to find my identity as a dancer yeah amazing so at some point you you'd made some decisions that you were going to do things differently and um so yeah, i get a message from petra on twitter saying oh do you fancy a jam and at the time i had like a little practice space in east london and um and i was trying to I, it's a well-timed message but um because at the time for me i was thinking ah oh, you know what like was doing some gigs i had my regular kind of commercial gigs i had like a couple of more creative things that i was involved in but i wasn't uh, i wasn't sure about them whether they were really for me or not and then petra sent me this message and i was like i used to love working with dancers like the the vibe of like the drummer dancer thing is a thing and i thought yeah we should whatever this is like yeah let's just do it so didn't you did you bring did you bring you had like a little portable you had like yeah. a portable tap board thing and then so you came up to my little rehearsal space which was just like um just a unit in an like a storage place but it had all the gear in it 
um, and we made a bit of space, didn't we? And you set your thing up, and I got out some brushes, and we um, we picked a few tunes, didn't we? Mm -hmm. And then we just jammed, and then I think we even, do you know what? I bet. I mean, I won't be able to find them today because they'll be in my storage unit at the moment from from when I moved house. But um, I will still have that piece of paper where we wrote down that. Do you remember I notated out like yeah the little arrangements we did for a couple of tunes? Because yeah, that was. Then um, I did not study. Because now afterwards I started started studying piano so I can be like, you know, learn more about music theory and actually learn more about the music rather than having this passive listening approach because I wanted to get more into it. But back then I was not there. Like, I think I was still like overrunning choruses and getting confused with, like which section we're in. And I, I think you even oh. sang along with the tune. We, yeah, I think we did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Like, was it a train or something like that might have been <laughs> like sang along the tune so i know where we are at the tune it was so funny but it was great i think we should repeat it after after the world opens up again that would be great and it's been a long time hasn't it so yeah that would be really good fun yeah i know yeah i would imagine you probably know more about the um you know even with me having done a degree in it i'm sure you know more about the history and the mechanics of it than i do these days so yeah that would be you can write some things out for me that'd be great i'll bring some transcript paper yeah 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 sounds good that was so much fun though it's so funny because i literally didn't wait long for your reply and you saying you looked and i also don't know how i came across you i don't know if somebody said your name to me or um because i must have followed you because of a, a reason i don't know if you weren't at a gig that I listened to, or I don't remember. Yeah, at that time, I was, uh, I mean, I've never been like, I've never been someone that's been, well, never is a silly word to say actually about this. In the time that I lived in, have lived in London, I was, oh, I was never someone, yeah, in that time, I wasn't going out to like a different jam every night, which I know you did more of, but, um, I was maybe a bit more conservative than that, but but at that time when you sent me that message, I was doing probably the most of that kind of thing than I ever had done. So yeah, it was, and also I was doing more. I mean, that was a fun time. I was doing. That's probably the God. I'm having some nice memories actually, Petra. Thanks when you've asked me about that. So talking about that. So that was a period of time where I was doing probably the most like smaller jazz gig type things in London than I have ever done since or of course before so probably yeah I probably was more around mm. um probably was more around and more sort of present than than I have been at all since but um yeah that was a fun time like um yeah I almost forgot that I had that period of time when I was doing more of that stuff actually so yeah that was a nice memory thanks um are there any other art forms that really inspire you other than music? I really love comedy, like quite uh, not in the sense of like wanting to be a comedian. But I think there's something, there's some link between like jazz and stand up comedy. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. I don't know what it is. I don't even need to know. But I feel like there's something between I mean, I've got fairly specific tastes on that front, which probably seem a bit old hat these days, but um, yeah, there's something in the energy and in the interaction with the audience. There's, you know, it's like you can't do stand up comedy. Well, it's weird to do stand up comedy on your own in a room to a television screen because you've, it's about an interaction. And I feel that about jazz and improvised music like you can do that just with other people on stage but i think it's best when you're the people you're interacting with are the larger group the audience energy wise um so comedy definitely um i think i'm going to put the coaching that i do now in that same category i consider that i consider that an art form really like there are there are lots of structural things in there and you know there are lots of little motors you use to make the thing work but ultimately it's an interaction between two people or even a group of people but it's a very human experience so yeah i'd put that in there um 
oh, I don't know if there is anything else. I don't know if there's much else. I think it's those two. I think they're the main things outside of music that are really like are really important to me. Um, you know, I read I read quite a lot, but it's usually sort of work or coaching related. You know, I, I don't read a lot of fiction particularly, but I think um, yeah. So I'll go with those two. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to make a statement now and you can elaborate one of them or both if you want. Oh. Art for art's sake or art as social action? Oh, Pocano lost us. Like, why choose? Have both. Um, yeah. What did you want me to do? You wanted me to pick one? Yeah. Or, or you can talk a little bit about both if you want. Well, there are definitely... I'm sure you'll have people better qualified than me to talk about both of those things on your podcast pair, but um wow well okay so art is what is it what could we say it's like the attempt it's an attempt to express something isn't it that you can't that is not better expressed just with words or an explanation and yeah that's got to have a you're definitely going to get better people to talk about this on your podcast better. But yeah, I think both. I think it's, it seems like it's really important to me because there are some things that you can play that you cannot say or that I cannot. There are some things that I can play that I cannot say. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it's the same for any artist, especially I'm sure it's for people that are further down their artistic journey than I am or possibly will ever be. I'm sure it's even more true that there are some things that um there are some sentiments that are better expressed through art than just explaining the situation to someone hmm. so yeah both i'm sure both and i'm and i hope that given the current situations that we find ourselves in in this country whether it's covid or brexit or all of the other things that we should be improving quickly at the moment um I, I hope that the people most affected by those things will have the opportunity to express that through art because we it's those are stories that we need to hear aren't they so yeah I hope I hope both and also keep for people after right yeah the a, a lot of reason like the reason we know so much about the civil rights movement for example is so many artists were documenting it singers uh, nina simone james mm -hmm. baldwin uh you know the situation like i think they, they became accessible all over the world via the art rather than via history because or like lessons at school because at school you, you kind of touch on a little bit at a time you know from every country you always have an incomplete story but once you develop your interests and you pick up a book, um, you know, Another Country, for example, was the first book I read from James Baldwin. And it immediately right. sucks you into this completely different reality that you didn't know. And it became very clear to me, even though I have never experienced it myself, because of it was a work of art. It wasn't, you know, in the news where you just, I feel like the news can be abstract sometimes, but the art, because it touches in with your soul, can be more straightforward that's nice isn't that interesting you the way that you put that is the opposite of the way a lot of people would assume that it was you said that the um the news can be more abstract than the art isn't that interesting like a lot of people would say it the other way around but oh, i'm sure that's yeah i'm sure you're right Petra. and um do you here's a question here's one for you that's all right so how do you think um so i suppose with um with live performance during previous struggles, let's put it like that, during previous struggles, earlier struggles, um, the, uh, the only censorship was, could you get a space to perform the music at, right? Like, I mean, I suppose there was like, did you have the opportunity to develop the skills, et cetera, to then express the thing in that moment? But in, if we just look at a snapshot in time, in that moment, the only censorship was could you actually get a space to perform whatever you needed to perform in? 
I wonder whether now with the internet, maybe we might get an even more uh, nuanced, detailed, artistic uh, expression of these times because, you know, you or I, or not quite anybody, because obviously not everybody has access to the internet and a smartphone or whatever, but it's relatively speaking, it's easier to document a piece of art and release it to the world now, isn't it? So I wonder whether we might, because of technology and so on, um, yeah, as time goes on, we might actually get to see more different versions of the story than we would have done before. You know, whereas before, you know, even if you were Nina Simone or someone like that, you, I mean, not that there was anybody else like that, but you'd have to, oh, you'd have to go through so much to even release your music yeah. to the world. Whereas now, maybe that's, maybe that's easier now. Maybe it's harder to get heard because there's a big volume of stuff being produced, but it's surely now it's easier for each person to to get their expression to make their expression available yeah we definitely have don't have to risk our lives to do that these days you just you know <laughs> put your email address into youtube and you can pull up your account and the next day you can start sharing your original work i mean for me yeah. it was like during the during the lockdown i started getting into filmmaking a little bit i did a course oh wow filmmaking <laughs> wanted to do some screen dance works because I wanted to still express myself whilst um, sitting in my room. And that's very instant because you can make a short film in a week. Yeah. It can also take a long time to make a short film, but like you can also take a week or like two weeks. My first one, I think I, w I did, it took me about a hundred hours to make it. Um, mm -hmm. and it took me about two weeks the you know the editing process and the filming process and that included me not knowing what i'm doing so if i right. yeah you know what like when you first start editing and you're like oh how do you import that again and how do you get the sound file from here to there it's like um it's you know it takes longer to do that and if you start doing it all the time then you get much more efficient so probably the same film now would take me half of the half the time but it's a very instant way to to work, um, you you do rely on your own skill of actually getting it out to people because if you just put it there, nobody sees it. Then mm -hmm. it was more like self therapy rather than a performance or like a, a public expression. But you know, it's it's possible now to create a short film in a week. You can make an Eventbrite link ha and send it out to your mail list, and people can watch the short film. You do a little discussion on Zoom. That's a very straightforward, readily available thing. And if you've got friends in other countries, they can zoom in. And, and it's definitely, from that aspect, it's definitely a, a little bit easier, just the, the pure mechanics of getting your work out there. But um, having quality seen is, is and, and being noticed is more difficult. Or maybe, maybe not more difficult, but also difficult because is so much noise out there mm. so what makes you different from everybody else why would they watch your event bright rather than the other 280 event brights in the five mile radius in london <laughs> you know? so that's that's the thing you have to talk about but from the pure aspect of expressing yourself i think especially in london london is so trendy you can and there's so many venues, so many fringe venues, you know, with 50 seats where you don't go in with a great financial risk to do a show, but you can still try uh, shows and develop shows to workshop performances. Like I used to perform at the Blue Elephant Theatre quite a bit because they are one where's of Where's that, Petra? Where's the Blue Elephant? Elephant? Yeah, it's where Charlie Chaplin was born, like down the street. Incredible. Um, and they're one of those theaters that specifically support upcoming work that hasn't been showed anywhere else yet. And if I want to do a theater piece about me and my vacuum cleaner, I can do that and I can market it and I have people in the audience because I, you know, whatever you sell it with. And that's what you can do in London. You know, there's not so much why. Also, one thing that I learned in experimental filmmaking, the teacher said there's a Russian director that said in avant-garde you don't ask why you ask what 
what do you want to expect right. and what mm -hmm. is worth documenting and that's the two what's that you what are my resources you don't ask why am i filming this crazy angle from my foot walking on you know like because avant-garde filmmaking has a lot of these close-up shots and mm -hmm. i literally spent the whole day filming drip ink dripping into water and stuff like that and if you'd start asking why you'd be screwed like you you sit at home and have a mental breakdown and 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 cry because like why why what's wrong and start doing psychoanalysis i'm like no just what do you, what do you want to express what are your resources resources the pot of ink and then what is worth documenting and then from the five hours of filming drops of ink and water you pick the three seconds you want and you know that that's that was actually really a big relief for me because i did ask myself why a lot right yeah i mean that sounds like an incredible that sounds like a great uh bit of insight that you've had there and that's interesting what i love what i love about hearing about that is that you you got that moment of insight which is super cool and the way you got that was from stepping outside of the creative act that you would normally do dance mm -hmm. you know into something parallel to try that and although it was i'm sure you had the idea of supporting you know augmenting what you did with dance um yeah isn't it great that you got that moment of insight that applies to all creative endeavors from stepping out of the thing that you normally do to try something out so i think that's so really cool actually i think that's really nice <laughs> all right so last um i know you're in into coaching a lot and you yeah. coach um creative professionals and you also coach normal people i i think it's mean to call them normal people but for lack of better words so civilians normal. yeah civilians. i feel like uh, we're almost a different species artists is <laughs> sometimes yeah um how did you get into coaching and did you obviously you get an education when you start doing your training as coaching how had has that changed you as an artist oh wow okay so uh i've always been super interested in sort of personal development and you know like pop pop psychology and motivation and all of that stuff you know being into it since i was a kid and um mainly because i read a lot of those kinds of books when i started my drum teacher um as well as getting me to get like two drum books when i signed up for lessons with him also got me to get a couple of other books which was to deal with the, the sort of mental game if you like you know um so i just I've been for, for as long as i've been playing drums i've been interested in that stuff as well got super into it did courses and all that kind of thing um and then about i guess it's four or five years ago I did a qualification in this thing called NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming, which the short version of what that is, is it's like, it's a way of thinking about how people think. That's the easiest way I can describe it, you know? Um, yeah. And so I'd wanted to do that qualification in that NLP thing for a long time. I wanted to go and learn about it properly. I've read you know, a load of books and I've used it with myself for a long time, but went to the qualification. And whilst I was doing that qualification, just a few new bulbs turned on for me. I was like, oh, actually, like I'm really, really into this in an even deeper way than I thought already. So then I went and did the next level up qualification, which is they call a master practitioner. So it's, and that's for people that instead of just wanting to use it the stuff to help themselves and maybe friends it's for people that maybe want to use it professionally as well that's how i look at that and again i just really i just love the training like it's quite intense training there's a lot to pick to get to get hold of um but i just really loved it and when i did that course i was even more inspired to like investigate that kind of work more and what i realized was apart from just playing the drums my part of my unique skills as and i'm going to use the artist word although i wouldn't have done maybe at the time i think part of my skills as an artist as a musician 
is actually in um, kind of managing people, creative people. And I know managing sounds like a boring word, but, you know, if like, I don't know, if a lo load of musicians that have never met together show up and you're in charge, like I sometimes am because I do a lot of musical directing or have done a lot of MDing, um, you've got to manage those people. Like you, there are lots of people who don't bother and I don't think they're very good. But for me, part of my job is to make sure everyone's cool. And if someone's struggling, if I'm in charge, then it's my job to move them from struggling to having a good time or doing the best they could possibly do. And what I realized was that in most of that work that I was doing, these NLP type skills were what was making the difference between me and some other guy that also did that job. So I noticed that. And then I started running workshops on like stress management for, for people. And I, you know, I was running these workshops for lots of teachers and performers as well. And then I was doing things on like goal setting and all the rest of it. And, you know, that got interest from creative types. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And I'd always had in the back of my mind this idea of pursuing the coaching specifically angle, which is just a way of facilitating change. You know, it's a way of having a conversation with someone that facilitates change. Um, and then the pandemic happened and I was like, what is the best way I could spend this time? So I went and did this coaching qualification, loved it. And again, as with all of the other things that I'd done, like enjoyed it even more than I thought I was going to. So that's how I got, that's how I got into coaching. And, um, and yeah, I, I love working with, as we said, just before we started sort of filming our chat, I love working with creative people. I don't exclusively work with creatives and performers, but I love that work because um, one of the brilliant things about performers and creatives and that kind of thing is um, an artist, sorry, is that, um, and I said this to you at the start, is that is like artists have the ability, are constantly developing the ability to kind of create a world internally that doesn't yet exist externally. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I would, not that I think this is some revelatory moment, but, I think maybe the artistic process is like making it inside and then moving towards changing the outside to reflect that. That's the, that's the artistic, that's the artist's job, I think. And, um, and if you can do that already, you become a bit of a dream to work with. If you're already internally creative and maybe you can associate some feelings with the things that you, that you can see or hear internally, um, yeah that that makes for a, a really fun coaching session because not everybody can do that people that aren't artists and don't do creative work you know the civilians as we were joking about normal people um they don't some of those people have never um have never examined their own processes whereas artists good artists have thought about i think anyway have probably examine the way that they do things in the world because they've had to you know i think gone are the days where creative people and artists just waited for the news to contact them and hoped for the best you know i think these days people have realized that you you have a role to play in encouraging the muse to to come forth you know and and i hope that was what you were asking about, because I've totally forgotten the question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a great end to this. Fireside Chat, you're my first um, interview. I'm excited. Thanks, Petra. Number I'm honored. <laughs> yeah. Right, thanks so much for coming on. <laughs>